Well, the title tonight is The Servant Brought Light to the Darkness. Don't we need some light in the darkness we find ourselves in? Uh, you know, there's a lot of darkness uh, in this world and a lot of, a lot of, it seems like it's just getting darker and darker uh, at, at times. But um, there's, so there's hope for the future and it's found in Jesus Christ. You know, the, the greatest events for some are seen as the worst events for, uh, for other people. It depends on how you look at things. And, you know, it kind of depends on your perspective uh, or even your opinion uh, about things. There was a, a story of a man in 1862. And uh, on this, this night, it was probably the, the most dangerous night of his life, and he had faced many dangerous times. But this night, he had people coming after him uh, that were hunting him, wanting to kill him, and he had nowhere to flee. Now, if I were to stop there, and you were to catch the date that I said, and you know anything about history, uh, you'd think, oh, this must be in the Civil War in America, uh, and something during the Civil War, and it was a very bad night. Well, you would be wrong. <laughs> uh, in that. Uh, it's, yes, it was during the Civil War, but it had nothing to do with happening here in America, but it was just during the year, one of the years of it. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's easy for us to make assumptions about things based on our experiences or our, our, based on our knowledge uh, or even the, the environment that we are in or we've, we've grown up in. And, you know, in a minute I'll continue that story, but, um, you know, we have a conception of what Christmas should be like. And, but many places in America, it's far different, uh, in, the, in the world, it's far different than it is in America. Uh, and a lot of places, you know, they wouldn't have a day off for Christmas uh, because, you know, they wouldn't celebrate a, you know, a Christian holiday uh, in, in that. And uh, many places in the world are, are different. Just this week, uh, I got to preach to s some widows in India, just online. Didn't have to pay, take the plane ticket, you know, get the plane ticket and take the plane. And then and the girls were able to teach uh, orphans, orphans and semi-orphans, uh, which means they've lost a mom or a dad. Um, but um, able to teach them the Christmas story, and then they, them over there, they gave them gifts and, uh, and things and a meal. And it was a special time. But we have what Christmas should be like and, you know, the big meal and, and time with, with friends and family and, and all of that. But for so many, it's different than that. Maybe it's a hard time of year. Maybe it's not a good time of year. Maybe it's when they remember pain that they're going through. You know, this last week I mentioned a friend that I know in, 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 uh, in Iowa that his mom died in a car accident last week and his brother-in-law uh, died in a different car accident the same day. Um, well, I found out since then that it was a drunk driver that caused his, you know, his mom to die in that accident. But, um, you know, in a year ago, there's a police officer in town uh, that I know, a lieutenant, that her mom uh, went to be with the Lord a year ago. You know, so those kind of things, that people think of that at this time uh, of year. But that one night 2,000 years ago means different things to different people. Now, unfortunately, many people want to pretend that Christmas has nothing to do with Christ. And you hear happy holidays all over the place, happy holidays, which, okay, it's a holiday and we want to be happy, so that's good, but no, it's, it's Christmas, you know, Merry Christmas. Uh, but our experiences can cloud our judgment and the things that we, we see. But many people, though, who like Christmas, they want nothing to do about Jesus. They want nothing to do with the truth that Jesus brought. Well, the story I was referring to is about John Payton, John G. Payton, and uh, he was a missionary to the, the islands that Captain Cook named the New uh, Hebrides Islands. And um, he was in the 1800s into the early 1900s, he was a, a missionary. And uh, this story I read uh, is in part of a, a book of a missionary that I know to Hong Kong, Matthew Conrad is writing this devotional, and this is in there, and it's a tremendous story. But in 1862, 
he was caught in a, in a tribal warfare there, kind of in the, in the middle as the tribal warfare was escalating because the European traders had given and sold muskets to the, the warring class uh, there, and so they were fighting against each other. And he was still trying to give the gospel and urging both Christians and non-Christians alike to fear God, but you know, continuing to preach the gospel. And a couple of the, the chiefs, they challenged him. You know, we don't fear Jehovah, they said. And he said, well, Jehovah will protect me. Well, they wanted to test God with that. They said, no, he's not here. We don't see him. Uh, and they sent warriors after him. Chiefs that he thought were, were on his side were his friends. And so he fled into a neighboring village. And the chief of that village said, yes, we will protect you. That is until the warriors started coming. And they said, no, you can't. And the chief said, no, you can't be in my house. But I'll allow you to go out and climb the chestnut tree out in the, in the field in the back. And we'll let you know when it's safe. So he went out there and climbed the tree, was worried that they would give his position away, uh, you know, under threat of, you know, of death or something. They would, but um, he spent the entire night up in that tree. And later he testified of that night and he said this, alone yet not alone. If it be to glorify my God, I will not grudge to spend many nights alone in such a tree, to feel again my Savior's spiritual presence, to enjoy his consoling fellowship. To feel his presence and to enjoy his fellowship. Huddled up in a tree all night with people wanting to kill you. How we view Christmas is determined by how we view Christ. How he viewed that night was determined by how he viewed Christ. It's a, you know, this is a, Christmas is a time, yes, most people like to spend with friends and families, and, and we talk about peace and goodwill toward all. Yet Mary, Joseph, and Jesus had a much different night that night he was born. So we're going to see four aspects of Jesus' life that will change your, your life forever. Point one here is he was born with nothing. And we're going to see his humility here. We're going to see how he was born with nothing. But then one of the interesting things we'll look at is the silent years of his, his life. But in Luke chapter 2, in verse 7, it says, And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. This verse about the birth of Jesus says as much about his humility as any other verse. Later we'll look at Philippians chapter 2, which is, you know, talks about his humility. But think about this. No, no, no other baby in history can, can, could control what family they were born into. Did you have any control over what family you were going to be born into or what country you were going to be born in? Or, I mean, maybe you had an opinion about when you were going to be born and you decided when, you know, I want to come now or I don't want to come. Maybe that, you know, I know Alyssa decided she wanted to come very late. Uh, you know, and typically after that, they want to come earlier. But uh, you don't have any control what family or what country you're going to be born in. But Jesus did. He could have decided, I want to be born in a palace and nothing harmful is going to happen to me. No, no potential of harm is going to... No, but he had prophesied where he would be born and the, in many of the details about how he would be born. And that is what happened. He fulfilled that. But that just shows his humility. His purpose wasn't to make life easy. It was to give us a new life. Make our life better. Think about the creators of the universe basically taking the control off of his life to a certain extent and saying, okay, I want to put my life in the hands, literally, of people. So he's now born, and now you have people he created holding him. And, you know, maybe someday we'll, we'll find out because he was completely God and he was completely man the whole time, we'll find out, you know, how much did he know as that baby? 
you know, we don't even know how much human babies know at that time. Could they be thinking, don't drop me, don't drop me? Maybe. <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, is Jesus thinking that all the time? Maybe. Um, but he probably knew that they weren't going to drop him. Or, you know, he, he got hurt just like everybody else, and maybe he knew, well, today is the day I'm going to skin my knee. Um, you know, he, he was God. But uh, so many of those things we don't exactly know. But the fact that he turned over control to people, you know, it, that he became one of us. He put himself down with us is just an incredible, humbling thing. In Psalm 8, verses 3 and 4, it says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the, the moon and stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Why did, he even, why did we even enter his thoughts? Why did he even consider us? The one who with his fingers made the moon and the stars. You know, as we were out watching Jupiter and Saturn, and man, that was beautiful looking at that. You know, it's amazing. We all go out there and see it because it's the closest together they've been in 800 years. But did you know that last night they were still out there? Tonight, they're still going to be out there, and they're just as beautiful. It's just we don't look. We don't take notice uh, so often. Oh, they're a little farther apart, but not a whole lot yet, you know, as they get uh, each night a little bit more. But we have an amazing creator. You know, as we were talking before the service, the, the orchids on the trees out there, you know, how beautiful uh, those are as they, you know, attach to the trees there, and, and uh they're, this is the second time they've bloomed this year, and which uh, the first time was during the lockdown. You know, we weren't having services and stuff, and it was just nice to have the extra beauty uh, out there. But the creator of the heavens and the earth came because he was mindful of us. He was mindful of you. He was mindful of me. He didn't come as a ruler, but he came as a servant, born in a stable where the sheep were born, wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. And then a year and a half later, the wise men came and gave them gifts, and then that night they had to flee and because Herod wanted to kill baby Jesus. He wanted to put an end to him. When he couldn't kill baby Jesus, he killed all the babies that were under two. So Mary and Joseph and Jesus, they fled to Egypt. And let's now continue with point two here is he lived quietly. So he was born not around family, of course his mom and dad, but not the rest of his family as they had been in Bethlehem and then now they fled to Egypt. And then years later after Herod died, they moved to Nazareth and we don't know much of what happens. When he's 12, he went to Jerusalem for a couple days, and we see the wisdom he already had at 12 years old, and then is silent for another 18 years. So you have about 12 years of silence, and then you have another 18 years of silence, and what did Jesus do for 30 years? Do you think there's any, hardly anybody that has not tried to be noticed in 30 years? Most people try to be noticed but we don't really take notice of them. Uh, us ourselves, you know, especially if you're in junior high, you want to be noticed. But um, most people don't take notice, except maybe with some annoyance sometimes. Uh, but Jesus, I think he tried not to be noticed. Because I think he could have, he could have done the amazing things he did in his ministry back, back then. He could have decided to start his ministry early, but no, he just, it wasn't time yet. The humility that it took for Jesus not to be noticed for 30 years, I think is amazing. The fact that there isn't stuff written about that time, I think shows his amazing humility. In Isaiah 53 and verse 2, it says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of the dry, a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So this is an Old Testament prophecy about Jesus Christ. Imagine if you were God living on the earth 
how would you create yourself? You would probably, you know, be tall, dark, and handsome. You'd be the smartest guy around, the best looking, and the strongest if you could create yourself. That's not what God did. He had no beauty that people should desire him. Instead, he was somebody that went unnoticed. In fact, his siblings didn't even believe that he was the Messiah during his ministry on this earth. Those three years, they waited, they didn't believe until after the resurrection. What an amazing, amazing thing. So he spent 30 years trying not to be noticed, just waiting for his time. You know, in, uh, you know, there's not many places here in the U.S. where you'd have to go down to the well and bring up water and, you know, and bring it to the house. But in India, uh, many places they do do that. And I, I, when I spoke to them on the other, other day, use this in, as an illustration. Imagine going to the well and only bringing one drop of water up and bringing it up to the house and, you know, putting it in a bowl and going back down and getting one more drop. I mean, it would probably evaporate by the time you got back with the next one, uh, especially in the heat of India. Uh, you know, it seemed ridiculous. Well, I imagine that Jesus, as he was a carpenter, it would have been easy to think, this is ridiculous. I can just do this and boom, I can create the world. And here I'm building this stuff with my hands. The humility it took for Jesus to, to do these things um, you know, can't be overestimated there. We know of the other times it shows the humility of Jesus, his birth, his death, but then all of his life showed his humility. And then his ministry started. Point three, he died horribly. So finally, he's able to start his ministry and most people reject him. Most people don't want to hear uh, him. Oh, yes, he had uh, crowds of thousands at times, but that was because, well, he was feeding people and he was, he was healing people. But then when it, when it came down to it, they all turned against him. Some of the same people that were saying, Hail, they were hailing him as he was coming into, into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. They were saying, crucify him, crucify him later that very same week. You know, I started with the story of, of John Payton spending the, that night in the tree. You know, yes, it was one of many dangerous nights and many lonely nights in his, his life. His response that one night was special because he was close to Jesus. He lived to be 82 years old, which says a lot considering he was a missionary to cannibals. He wasn't living in the United States of America or, you know, or it's any, somewhere where it's, it's nice or peaceful or something. He was a missionary to cannibals. Uh, he said this, Looking up in unceasing prayer to our dear Lord Jesus, I left all in his hands and felt immortal till my work was done. That night in that tree, they didn't kill him. He died at the age of 82 peacefully uh, in, in, in bed. But he had went through many struggles, many trials. Three months after their arrival there in those, those islands, him and his wife Mary, they gave birth to their son Peter. But just 19 days later, Mary died from a tropical fever that she got. And newly born Peter died at 36 days of age. Well, John buried his wife and his child together close to their, their home near uh, Resolution Bay. And you know what he spent his nights doing for the near future? Sleeping on their grave to protect them from the local cannibals. Talk about lonely nights on the, the grave of his wife and, and baby, and other nights in a tree. But he was comforted in those nights. How could he be comforted in those nights? Because somebody else had spent lo lonely nights, night after night, 
Jesus, who had no place to lay his head. Jesus, who was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as he was there praying, he was sweating as it were great drops of blood. He had asked the disciples to pray with him, and they couldn't even stay awake. What a lonely night that must have been. What a lonely night that must have been as the disciples fled when the soldiers came. As most of them stayed away as he hung on the cross. John was there. Peter was afar off there denying him as he was being beaten. What lonely nights. But because he had suffered those lonely nights, he can give comfort to us. He's been there. He's felt pain. He has felt suffering. And he can get us through lonely nights. He can be that, that candle, that light in the night. He can give us that peace. He can give us that hope, that comfort. Because he suffered. And why did he suffer? He suffered because he loved us. He's the only innocent person and he died for all of the guilty people. All of us who are guilty. In Isaiah chapter 53, picking up in verse 3, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from Him. He was despised and we esteemed Him not. Surely He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. They didn't believe that he was God. Unfortunately, many people today don't believe that he was God. They don't trust him as the Messiah, as the one who paid for their sin debt. They killed him at that time in the most horrific way and this is again a prophecy of that of that time of what would would happen and it happened exactly that way the only reason that we have can have peace of mind today is because jesus died for us the only way we can have peace on earth goodwill toward men is because jesus sacrificed we can't have peace without sacrifice And Jesus was that sacrifice. So many people do not have that peace because they do not have Jesus Christ. Oh, they have some of Jesus, but they're also trusting in their own good works, thinking that, well, if I'm good enough, if I go to church, if I do certain things, then maybe I can be good enough to go to heaven. Oh, yes, they believe in Jesus, but they don't trust Him and Him alone for their salvation. They think they have to work their way to heaven. But no, Jesus came and died to pay our sin debt. You see, everyone who is ever born except for Jesus is born a sinner. And I'm going to let my phone here represent sin. We're all sinners. I'm going to let my hand represent all of us when we're all born in sin. And the wages, the payment of that sin is death. If we die with that sin unpaid for, we will die and spend an eternity in hell forever and ever apart from God, and it's you know, darkness and fire forever and ever. But God loved us so much. He said, I don't want anybody. He's not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. So he gave the greatest gift this world has ever known, and that's what we're celebrating at Christmas. Let this hand represent Jesus. He gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith. See, how, how are you saved? Is it through works? No, it says you're saved through faith. You put your trust and faith in Jesus, that he died on that cross, shed his blood, was buried, and the third day rose again, paying for your sin. And it goes on, and not of yourselves. See, You can't do it yourself. Jesus did it for you. It is the gift. At Christmas time, we give gifts, right? We give gifts. Well, this is the free gift of eternal life. Accept it. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You can't work for it. It's a gift. 
Trust Jesus Christ and Jesus alone for your salvation. He is the only way to heaven. You know, peace doesn't usually happen without sacrifice. We can't have eternal life in heaven without the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You know, there's, you know, that's applicable to so many other things today. Um, you know, 244 years ago today on Christmas Eve, many soldiers that were suffering through a very cold winter made sacrifices without which we wouldn't have this country here today. As they crossed the river with George Washington and, um, and won the, really the first victory and they won a first decisive victory of our war for independence. Without that, that victory there, we probably wouldn't have a country. They probably wouldn't have made it through the winter. They wouldn't have had the funding and so many other things. Um, you know, France wouldn't have stepped in and, and with their funding and things. It took sacrifice in order to lead to the peace that we have. Well, Jesus sacrificed so that we might have peace. But it didn't end there with his sacrifice. He rose triumphantly. And so what does that mean for us today? So yes, he died, but he rose again. And so our lives are forever changed because he rose from the dead. Because of this, uh, because of this, we can learn so much uh, from him. Had he stayed dead, there would be nothing that we could learn from him. He was just a man. But no, he was God who died in our place. In Philippians 2, verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The mind that he had, and that passage goes on to say that he humbled himself to be fashioned like a man, to become one of us. And then he went on to give his life for us, even the death of the cross, in such a humble, humble manner. He said, let this mind be in you. Let this humility be in you. Put others before yourself. Take that as an example. And so throughout these four points today, I think we've seen the one thing I want us to get is the humility of Jesus Christ. And we need to be humble as well because without the humility of Jesus Christ, without us being humble, following in His footsteps, we are going to, are going to be resisted by God. God resists the proud but gives grace unto the humble. And in Romans chapter 1, in verse 16, we'll close before our candlelight service, candlelight part of it, it says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I want you to think about this. The gospel was the most humble act in, mankind, in the history of the world. Jesus, being God, coming to this earth and dying for us and offering his life, offering salvation as a free gift. Just saying, trust me. Believe that I paid for your sin debt. That's the gospel. And that showed the ultimate, the ultimate humility. But what is the next statement? For it is the power of God unto salvation. In that humility is great power the greatest power the world has ever known, the power to take us from death unto life, the, the, the power to take us from a destination of eternity in hell to a home in heaven forever. That, in that humility is great power. We need to take the example of Jesus Christ and know we can't die for anybody's sins, but we can be humble. We can take that message of hope to someone else. And we can see the power of God in their life through the gospel that Jesus gave to, to everyone as a free gift. You think of the people who are in darkness, the people who have no hope, they have no peace. Imagine that dark night in that tree that John Payton was, or the nights that he was on the, the tomb, you know, the graves of his wife and baby, those lonely nights. But because he had Jesus, 
He had comfort. He had a peace. You know, as we think about peace and goodwill toward men, when you're in total darkness, the comfort that a little light brings can't be exaggerated. You know, if somebody's able to get a fire and they're lost in the woods, that fire brings so much comfort. Because it's not just the light and the darkness, but the warmth that it brings. It brings about some peace. You can see, you can maybe see dangers that might be there. So I want us to think about the peace that Jesus can bring. So what I'll do is I'll um, light my dad's here and then he'll light a couple and then each of you can light someone's. And what you're going to do is like what he did is dip his candle to the lit candle. So don't dip your lit candle uh, because you'll dump wax on your lap. Uh, that won't feel good. Um, these don't drip a lot compared to most. Um, but just be careful. Uh, we don't want to start any fires. If you, have if you have a lot of hairspray in your hair, don't get it close to your hair. Uh, we want to be... But just think about the, the peace that Jesus brings. And as we're, we're doing that, I'm going to just um, play the, a video here, and it'll be just reading Luke chapter 2. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them.
That passage, though, in Luke chapter 2, there's probably, it's probably hard to find a more beautifully written passage than Luke chapter 2. And, but it, it's more than just beautiful because of the, the language and stuff in there, but it's because of what it stands for, what it means for, for us, not only as Christians, but for the, for the world, the hope that it gives each of us the peace that we can have because Jesus came for us. You, you know, Henry Longfellow, you know, the, he's famous for the, the poem, Paul Revere's Ride. Um, he also wrote the Christmas song, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. And he had a hard, he had a hard life. He lost his, his first wife after uh, she had a, a miscarriage. And then in 1861, two years before writing I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day, he lost his second wife in a, in a, in a, a fire. Uh, and so in, a, in a horrible way. And shortly thereafter, his son, Charles, went off to, to war, joined the Union Army, Without telling his dad, he left his dad a note and went off to, to war, became a lieutenant. And so this is 1963, um, I guess when he had, had left, and he was wounded in November of 63 and was paralyzed. And they didn't know if he was going you know, to get that, the feeling back and movement back, but on Christmas Eve... 1863, he was able to sit up. And that is when Henry Longfellow wrote the words to, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Their old familiar carols play. And wild and sweet, the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And though how as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day, a voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep, God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. We put that song in the context of the Civil War, and there was no peace, but with Jesus Christ there could be peace even at that time, even the things we face as a nation here today, we can have peace if we stay close to Christ. There's a hymn called Nailed to the Cross by Kerry Breck, and I want to, to read this and think about the reason we have peace is because Jesus died. And so let's think, think about this as I read this. There was one who is willing to die in my stead, that a soul so unworthy might live. And the path to the cross, he was willing to tread all the sins of my life to forgive. He was tender and loving and patient with me while he cleanses my heart of its dross. But there's no condemnation. I know I'm free, for my sins are nailed to the cross. I will cling to my Savior and never depart. I will joyfully journey each day with a song on my lips and a song in my heart that my sins have been taken away. They are nailed to the cross. They are nailed to the cross. Oh, how much He was willing to bear with what anguish and loss. Jesus went to the cross, but He carried my sins with Him there. We can have peace today because Jesus took our sins to the cross. 
I want to have a, a word of prayer and then we'll sing Silent Night. But while, you're, while we're praying, keep, you, keep your eyes open. Um, I don't want you closing your eyes and forgetting you have a fire in your hand. Um, but let's, let's pray and ask for God's peace. Dear Father, we don't know what the future holds. We don't know what tomorrow holds. And as I plan to preach on January 3rd, 2020 2.0, we don't know that that's not going to be the case. That 2021 could be worse than 2020. But Lord, you know. You know what tomorrow holds. You know what pains we're going to face. You know what suffering we're going to have. And you will be there. We thank you for that, that you can give us peace no matter what comes our way. We thank you that we can have peace because of what you did for us on Calvary. We thank you for the salvation that we have and the peace that comes with us. Lord, those that are hurting, help them to come to you, to draw near to you as you promised that you will draw near to us when we do that. Lord, help us to share the peace that we have with other people as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.